Mayors have had to, to make unprecedented decisions and work with state and national officials to protect the health and safety of their residents. They've done this while facing massive budget shortfalls and transitioning their own offices to working remotely. To expertly moderate this panel, we have Financial Times U.S. editor-at-large, Jillian Tett. Jillian, it's great to have you at the forum again and for the first time doing this virtually. Thank you very much indeed. It's great to be here. And having been introduced as an expert moderator, I can only disappoint and go downhill, I think. But anyway, great to be here. And we have a truly fantastic trio of mayors who are going to be talking about what's been happening on the ground in their cities in practical terms as they've been battling not just COVID, but the economic pain and the many policy challenges which have befallen them and what that suggests about where America is going in terms of the relationship between municipalities and the federal and state structures. So we have Jenny Durkin, who is the mayor of Seattle. We've got Bill Peduto, who's mayor of Pittsburgh, and Francis, Francis Suarez, who's mayor of Miami. Um, so we're covering America, um, both the warm and the cold and the, well, somewhere in the middle. But anyway, I'd like to start perhaps with you, Mayor Suarez, because we actually spoke a few months ago, um, because back then you were in this awful distinction, I think, of being the only mayor who'd actually had COVID. Is that correct? That's right. I was the, the only the first. That's right. Right. Absolutely well, tell, right. Us a, tell, us a bit about, tell us a bit about what you've been doing on the ground and how your own experience of having had COVID, um, you know, influenced your policy making. Um, and maybe you can give some tips for the president since he is also now in that position. Well, thank you. It's, a, it's an honor to be invited to this prestigious panel with the two good friends who are uh, mayors of, of two great cities in America. Uh, first, uh, I think I was not only um, the first elected official or the first mayor uh, in the United States that had COVID, I was only the second person in Miami-Dade County in my entire uh, county of three million people that got COVID. So uh, one of the things I realized right away was uh, that you could be asymptomatic uh, and, and be a carrier and potentially a spreader. And so uh, I quarantined right away before I even knew I was positive, just because I knew that I had been in close contact with someone, I quarantined. That quarantine lasted um, 18 days. Uh, I, I tested throughout the quarantine period, and it wasn't until uh, I tested negative twice in a 24-hour period on day number 17 and on day number 18 <clears throat> that I felt it was safe and that the medical experts that I was consulting with felt that it was safe for me to be out in public. So, uh, you know, for me, I think the first uh, thing that I would uh, say as, as maybe advice uh, to the president is, uh, you know, and, and certainly I was at, at a much uh, a smaller scale. Uh, people are paying attention and they're paying attention to every single detail. And, uh, you know, there's a tremendous amount of fear because of the fact that this is a highly infectious and deadly disease. And so uh, it's imperative that, that you be transparent and that, uh, you know, that, that people know exactly where you stand medically uh, so that they can feel comfortable and so that they know that uh, being around you is something that can be uh, done safely. Um, I also uh, realized uh, after 17 or 18 days the difficulty that people would have in quarantining. Uh, I had to struggle as mayor uh, to figure out where I was going to quarantine. I actually quarantined at my house. My wife had to uh, stay with uh, my in-laws. So I was very fortunate that they had the ability to do that. So I pushed uh, very early on for there to be hotel beds available for people to be able to quarantine. Because I knew that if you were a family of, of, of five uh, living in a one bedroom apartment or even a two bedroom apartment, uh, if one person got sick, unless they were able to quarantine that person, uh, the entire family was going to get sick. And we saw that phenomenon occur during the first spike uh, in June. Right. So in terms of sort of what you have rolled out locally, and I'm going to turn to um, the other two mayors, in terms of what you've rolled out locally, I mean, how have you tried to tackle it on a local level, um, given your, you know, shortage of resources? The first thing that we did was uh, we implemented a mask in public rule and that, uh, and we find it, uh, people who didn't uh, use the mask. We found that there was a very high utilization rate. Uh, we got about 80 to 90 percent of people using the masks. And we reduced uh, the incidence of COVID in our community from about 3,500 a day at its high point in the county 
to now we're in the 400 range. So about 85% reduction just by using a mask in public. So that's another thing that's been a little bit of a frustration for me is not seeing other elected officials uh, at state level and federally implement, uh, you know, uh, implement a solution that's so easy. And that, by the way, is the only solution that you can implement that doesn't harm the economy. And uh, it's been frustrating. I've called for a statewide and national mask in public rule. Um, unfortunately, that hasn't happened. And I think uh, we've had more cases as a result. Well, it's interesting because mask wearing is something that states can do. As you say, it doesn't cost a lot, um, but it does look from the data as if it's surprisingly effective. And it's a very powerful cultural symbol in some ways, um, both on the individual level that it reminds the wearer that they have to modify their behavior at all times, but also it's a symbol for local initiatives, if you like. Um, Bill, I could see you nodding um, while Mer Suarez spoke. Um, have you done that as well in Pittsburgh? We have not. Uh, and in fact, it's sort of a different uh, story in Pittsburgh. Uh, our local government does not oversee uh, health. That's done at a county level and at the state level. However, we are on the front line when it comes to the challenges that have been created through this pandemic. So our public safety services were forefront uh, going back all the way into January. Uh, our concern back in January, uh, and this was through uh, consultation with the CDC, was when the pandemic hits uh, the United States, what is the likelihood that it could spread through a police zone, a fire station, a, a medic station? And having to take that entire station offline, what types of contingency uh, planning were we being made available? all the way to having 40% of our public safety crews uh, under a certain type of quarantine. So we began planning for that uh, rapidly in February and implementing it in March uh, because we were it, at the early part of it, we were able to purchase our PPE at a time when there wasn't that great of a demand. So we were, we were pretty good. But there were challenges that we uh, weren't prepared for, at least hadn't thought of. Uh, one of the most immediate was how to convert our Parks and Recreation Department into a supplier of food. Um, you know, we have some after school programs, we have lunches for seniors, but uh, between March and today, we have provided over a quarter of a million meals and we didn't have any operation experience in that. So we were able to prepare uh, a little bit earlier than others. We were able to work with our hospitals, but at that same time, we faced what other cities faced, which is an expansion of our duties, responsibilities uh, without the authority, but the immediate need to take care of people. Right. Now, I know that Pittsburgh has been building quite a striking niche in healthcare in recent years. Can you tell us a bit about how that's helped you devise policy um, on the ground? And then I want to ask the same about Seattle, which I know has been doing a very interesting partnership with the University of Washington. But tell us a bit about how Pittsburgh has been trying to deal with the health issues, even though you don't have direct control of health policy, unlike Miami. You're right. So what we do have control of is, like I said, is public safety. And we had had uh, H1N1 and Ebola uh, protocols, which were in writing to be able to deal with uh, potential outbreaks at those points. But what we were able to do was to work with two different hospital networks, uh, um, Allegheny Health Network and UPMC, in order to be able to up our game uh, to be able to expand the operational side of public safety all the way from the very moment that any public safety official were to walk into any home, knowing or unknowingly uh, with a person who may uh, test positive for COVID, all the way through the delivery of service to the individual within the hospital system. At no time during uh, these past several months have our hospital systems uh, become strained 
But even though they weren't strained, we were still working with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to convert our convention center into a makeshift hospital if needed. And those plans are now part of our operational plans. And what's interesting about it is, as we go through this pandemic, we're building out a resiliency strategy that could apply to a flood. It could apply to a heat wave. It could apply to a man-made disaster, uh, just as it is applying right now to COVID-19. Right. Well, that's fascinating. Well, I want to pick this up in a moment about how these lessons are shaping preparation for the future in terms of municipalities and their interaction with federal government. But first, um, I'd love to get a, a view from Mayor Dirk and Jenny about Seattle, because, I mean, Seattle has got um, both this extraordinary pool of tech know-how, but also medical know-how at the University of Washington. How have you been trying to pull that together to inform your local response? Jillian, great to see you and great to be here with our fellow mayors. You know, this has been the most challenging time, I think, for mayors across America. We are the front lines um, and we are the first to see COVID in the Seattle area. And when we discovered that we had in the community, we had no federal leadership. They had missed it on the testing. And fortunately, we were a place that had a lot of uh, world renowned scientists and a great tech company. We moved immediately creating our own playbook, trying to get people to work from home. And that showed that we were able to flatten that virus really quickly by having such a quick response from our employers and the city. Um, but then we needed to employ a whole other series of measures um, because suddenly we had no playbook for all the ramifications, the health ramifications and the economic ramifications. So we had to change city government to be able to provide first frontline economic assistance to workers and to small businesses. To, I, had, I entered one of the first orders to stop evictions of residents and small businesses and nonprofits in Seattle so we wouldn't have more people on the street. We changed our programming to deliver hot meals to seniors and grocery vouchers to families. We had to stand up um, in our, our park system, uh, child care centers for our frontline workers. So we had to move a whole range of things. But we also saw that it became a hunger games between cities and states fighting for the limited resources to fight this virus because there was no national leadership. Um, in Seattle, we were very fortunate to tap into the great vast network of really smart people, great scientists, great tech people, and mostly a really great resident base where people stepped up and did what they needed to do to fight this virus, even though it was hard on them personally. Um, a couple examples of what we had to face as a city, because we lacked testing through another uh, forum that I was on and a relationship I had with the, a mayor in South Korea, Seattle was able to get testing supplies. So now we have been able to stand up free testing for Seattle residents and account for almost 15% of 12 to 15% of the testing statewide. Um, this has helped us to go from one of the first in looking at almost 70,000 people could have been infected in a trajectory like Italy's or New York's at the time to now we have one of the lowest COVID-19 rates of any major city in the country. We're wearing masks. People are, they don't think it makes them look weak like our president does. They know it shows. They care for themselves, their neighbors, and their friends. Um, we are testing people, and we are still staying at home and taking smart things, um, measures around our businesses to keep people safe. So we will continue to work together as a city. Mayors are working together across this country to learn best lessons from each other, to see what's working, to help each other, um, and to write the playbook as we go. We are in this together, not just in America, but across the country. And that has, I think, built a sense of unity that we know that to get through this, we've got to be smart. Right, right. Now, I'd like to pick you up on the issue point about the Hunger Games, because one of the really ugly things that happened initially was this degree to which there was a vicious competition unleashed between the states and the cities and sometimes almost encouraged for PP and other resources. In your views, maybe I'll start with Mayor Suarez on this, 
what could and should have been done to avoid that? And what does that suggest about how states should interact with federal government going forward? Well, like Mayor Peduto, uh, we identified this threat early, um, probably in late January, early February, and we ordered PPE equipment quickly as well, which uh, you know allowed us to be stocked up. One of the areas where there was a, an enormous Hunger Games uh, like attitude, uh, where Mayor uh, Durden was was talking about, uh, is particularly when it came to the CARES Act funding. Um, if you were not a city that had a population, according to the census, of over five hundred thousand or more, you did not get a direct payment uh, from the federal government for the CARES Act. So, for example, a city like Atlanta, my good friend uh, Keisha Lance Bottoms is the mayor. They had a population adjusted at 506,000. They got $88 million from the CARES Act, which was critical uh, to helping do a lot of the things uh, that Mayor Durden was talking about in terms of helping your small businesses uh, from going bankrupt, uh, feeding people, uh, creating, uh, you know, helping people pay their rent, helping people pay their mortgage, et cetera. Uh, You know, the city of Miami got $0 from the CARES Act, $0. And we're a city that had a $20 million surplus going into COVID. We ended the year with a $25 million deficit. So we had to pay that deficit out of our reserves. And we started the new fiscal year, which began October 1st, with a $33 million deficit. So we were actually looking at uh, the possibility of having to let go of police officers and firefighters, those who were on the front lines, who were taking the most risk in this COVID fight to protect our citizens and our residents. And so I think uh, that was a a major mistake uh, in the rush to get all that money out. Uh, there was there there was not a thought to to allow cities that were slightly below or all the cities that were below, which is the vast majority of them, uh, of 500,000 in population. There's only 30 plus cities in America that met that threshold. So almost all the cities got cut out. Uh, counties did not uh, have a requirement to share the money with cities. States didn't have a requirement to share the monies with cities. And so cities got completely left out for some reason. And the cities are the ones that are closest to the people. We are the 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 entities. Uh, that are able to get that money to those people in the quickest, most efficient, and the best way uh, to help them. And so it was incredibly frustrating. I'm hoping that in uh, whatever CARES Act uh, or HERO funding or whatever whatever it gets called in the next round of funding from Congress, they fix uh, that that mistake. They they give it as a, as a uh, they apportion it based on a CDBG formula, like we receive CDBG. Uh, community development block grant funds from the federal government. And and also they allow us as cities uh, to use the funds for what they call revenue shortfalls. Uh, because again, it's no fault of our residents that or our employees that this happened and they shouldn't be the ones that have to suffer the consequences of it. Right. What about, um, that's, I, mean, I think the point you make about the cutoff is very um, striking and also if nothing else, shows the importance of the census, um, which, of course, is another story we could all talk about. But Mayor Peduto, um, did you get the CARES Act funding? Um, And, you know, what lessons do you learn about the scramble for resources? Well, I couldn't agree more strongly with Mayor Suarez. Um, I think people don't realize or, or maybe they don't take the time to think about it. But The way that cities are financed is very different than states or even counties. You know, we rely upon different types of sources of revenue, uh, whether it's an amusement tax with our major sports teams and entertainment or a parking tax or other types of revenue sources um, that don't have a built in resiliency to a pandemic. So unlike in Pennsylvania, where income is based not only upon what you earn in your paycheck, but also the dividends you're earning in the market, the city of Pittsburgh can only tax on your paycheck. And as you see people becoming unemployed, we're losing those resources, but the state's still receiving it off of the windfall of Wall Street. So what we realized very early on is we don't have a resilient system in order to be able to provide revenue during a pandemic. And like Miami, we are facing a $75 million deficit as I prepare my budget for the upcoming year. 
our budget begins on January 1st, and I am in a situation where I have spent down our reserve funds. I have frozen any new hiring and laid off people through attrition, and we have cut every single dime and nickel that we could possibly do, but we're still facing a $75 million deficit out of a $600 million budget. And this is why we have a federal government. At those times when we need to help each other, whether it is through a flood or a hurricane or terrible fires, we're there for one another in order to be able to help us. Cities across the United States this year alone are facing over $360 billion in lost revenue. And the CARES Act money that came to the states has not trickled down to the cities where the services are the most critical. And just as Mayor Suarez said, what this will mean is at the time that we need emergency personnel the most, we will be forced because of inaction in Washington to lay off police officers, to lay off firefighters, and to lay off medics. Until Washington understands that they do have a role in not providing a handout, but allowing the opportunity for cities to be able to survive these next two years, that the inaction that they are taking will not only slow, but it will stop economic recovery from happening in this country. Well, that is pretty terrifying. And I should say, by the way, if anyone's watching and listening and feels like me, pretty um, somber and wants to ask more questions about this, um, do please go ahead. And I'm going to pick up the questions in just a moment because we've got some questions coming through already. But um, I'm curious, um, you know, what do you think is going to happen if this does not get addressed? And do you have any confidence that after the current election, the situation may get become a bit better? Perhaps I can start by asking Seattle, because in some ways, Seattle is in a much better position, given your strong local um, corporate um, networks and your reasonably strong local tax base. You, you know, Seattle is in a strong position uh, in one regard, and I have to apologize to my friends, the mayors, because Seattle early on, because we were one of the first in COVID, I saw and recognized the economic harm it was going to be doing. And we lobbied very hard to get direct funding from Congress as CARES Act was going through. So we were one of the cities that was able to do so. But just like the other cities, our revenues have been decimated. Um, I had to readjust our 2020 budget. We had about a $300 million hole we had to make up and the same for next year. So local revenues have been decimated across America. If Washington doesn't act, I think you will see not just a stalling of any chance of an economic recovery, but I think we could really dip down into possibly facing depression area things again. The number of people unemployed in Seattle is at a record number. The number of people who could be losing their homes and because they can't pay their rent is at a record number. So if Congress doesn't act, they are deciding they don't believe in America. We need Washington to act. And I want to go back to your other question about the Hunger Games, because you asked what tools we had in place. The federal government has strong tools to make sure that we can harness the great innovation and genius of the American system of innovation and manufacturing and make sure that we respond to crises. We did it in World War II. We've done it other times in our history. We failed to do it in COVID. And if we don't do it, and if we haven't learned the lessons from the last failures of COVID, we may end up in the same as vaccinations come. Because everyone, every city in America will be looking for vaccinations at the same time. Because until there is either a vaccination or effective treatments, we will remain in these limited COVID shutdowns and isolated from each other. But we're not just competing with each other. The whole globe will be coming out of COVID at the same time. And we already know there could be critical shortages of the ability to manufacture and transport enough vaccine 
for countries across the world, let alone cities across America. The Washington right now today isn't planning for that. We have not yet harnessed our manufacturing capability and our ability for to get vaccines to people, let alone to make sure that people get those. Um, and so I'm very fearful that if we don't learn the lessons from the past as a nation, again, you're going to see state versus state, city versus city, really scrambling to treat, be the ones who can get the vaccinations for the residents in their city so the businesses and workers can thrive. Right. Well, in fact, it's great you said that because, in fact, we get a question from John Slocum, um, which basically ties into this very nicely, which is, what is the responsibility of national government with respect to vaccination? Yeah. Um, the coordination of the distribution is the primary uh, responsibility of the federal government. When we think about this, uh, we have to start thinking like two steps ahead. You know, you, you simply can't put these vaccinations on a truck and ship it to where it needs to go. They, they need to be in a cold atmosphere, that, which means we need refrigerated transportation in order to be able to ship. It, it, we don't have enough trucks in this country to be able to distribute right now. And that's just one little part of the logistical steps that will be needed in order to be able to coordinate a mass national program, let alone a global program. Uh, the production of the vaccination itself in the locations of where they need to be so that the vaccination will remain um, uh, able to, to treat the pandemic. Uh, you can't just have one distribution center for an entire nation and one production center as well. And, and so all of these different logistics of what is going to be needed in the next six months, if there is any conversation happening out of Washington, it is not coming down to the local level. And my worry is that they're not even considering it but the, what they're thinking is the market will be able to handle it. Just like we saw on the supply side and the chains of manufacturing break down during this past year on everything from uh, prescriptions to electronics to basically anything that is made. We do not have that chain in place in this country to be able to provide a mass distribution of a vaccine. And the federal government's responsibility is to coordinate the efforts between the states in order to do so. Right. Um, Mayor Durkin, do you want to comment on that or shall I move to the next question? No, I think that um, my friend has got it just right. And I'm very concerned because first there is, how do you get a safe vaccine? Um, and I'm very worried that the political pressures that the president is placing on having a vaccine before it's safe will not only end up with not a safe vaccine, but people will be suspicious on whether they can trust it. Second, in the America, we have about three different manufacturers who are slated to bring the vaccine online. Some require two shots, some require one. Um, and we don't have the capacity to either get it um, manufactured at scale or to distribute it. Um, let alone to do that in a period of time that we can actually get people vaccinated enough of them to change how we're living. So I'm very concerned that we've not taken the steps first for the adequate testing. Second, right now to be ready to manufacture it in a way that it can get to all Americans. Second, you know, if you're a person that needs two shots, we've shown through other medical interventions that, that there is less likelihood that someone will go back for their second shot. And if they don't, Will they have the same immunity that they need? Do they know which shot they got so they know which second shot to get? Um, we also have things like a global worry that we will not have enough glass for the vaccination. Um, and so the pressures on the manufacturing and, and systems itself have not been thought through. So I'm very concerned that we keep promising the hope of a vaccine to Americans and that's when their lives can get back to normal 
But the federal government, the only people who have the authority to make it happen and plan for it, aren't taking the steps they need now to make sure that that can happen. Well, that's very concerning. I must have been, I was very struck the other day because I was chatting to the CEO of, a uh, former CEO of General Motors, who told me they ran out of elastic, the most basic product imaginable, when they were trying to make PPE and discovered it was almost impossible to get enough basic elastic. Um, they had to sort of improvise with something out of a car door instead. And you look at that and you think about how, as you say, how can you find the glass for the vaccines? How can you find all the parts, you know, which people are relying so much on? Um, okay, a couple of other questions we've got. Um, question from Gabrielle Sade via YouTube, which is, a city that relies heavily on sales tax and income tax are much more vulnerable. How can a city become more resilient looking forward other than relying on sales tax and income taxes? Um, maybe that should be one for maybe uh, Mer Suarez. So in our case, uh, we don't rely on income tax at all. So I think that's one of the ways uh, to be more resilient. Uh, we uh, don't uh, impose any tax on income. We do have a sales tax, and that sales tax obviously this year was obliterated. Uh, we do have other fees, as Mayor Peduto said uh, in, in uh, Pittsburgh. We have uh, parking revenue. We have franchise fees. We have a variety of other uh, revenue sources, uh, building fees, et cetera, that we generate revenue from. So we're not exclusively... Um, you know, a sales tax base, but we also do, re and by the way, the sales tax that we receive is not direct, it's a pass through from the state. 45% of the largest revenue category that we have is property tax revenue. And so the good thing about property tax revenue is, for example, in a year like this year, part of the reason why maybe our deficit is not as bad as Pittsburgh is because a big portion of our, uh, of our taxes come from property taxes that are set beginning January 1st. So essentially our values were locked in January 1st of this year uh, for tax revenue that we receive in November of this year. So that's the way it's structured for us. Where we're gonna take a hit is next year uh, in terms of property taxes, uh, potentially. And I say potentially because despite the COVID crisis, uh, the real estate in Miami has continued uh, to, to grow uh, in terms of uh, sales, in terms of uh, value. Uh, we still continue to attract people from other parts of the country, uh, particularly from the New York area uh, as one of the particular areas. So it's possible that our, our deficit, and um, we're hoping obviously that sales tax revenue increases, parking revenue increases as, as the economy is able to safely open. Uh, and then we're hoping that the hit that we may have uh, potentially seen on the real estate property side is not as dramatic because uh, it, we just, we, we're living in a, in a sort of a, a, a time which is somewhat of an anomalous time where despite this global pandemic, it appears that our real estate market continues to be strong. And so that's something that we've just been very fortunate. We've tried to maintain our city safe. We try to maintain our taxes low. Um, but yeah, one of the ways to diversify is, is, is of course, to have different kind of taxing uh, sources. Um, I know whether either Mayor Durkin or Mayor Perdita wants to, um, want to jump in there, but if not, I have another question. Either of you want to comment on how you diversify your revenue base? I, I would just add one other thing. Uh, cities are the home to the institutions that provide service to an entire region. So a lot of city property is uh, either non-taxable or non-profit and tax exempt. In the city of Pittsburgh, it's 45% of our entire city is non-taxable. <clears throat> And that's seven universities, a dozen hospitals, and other large institutions. And it may have made sense when nuns ran hospitals in the 1890s when the laws were passed in Pennsylvania, but it really doesn't make sense today. If we are going to have a resilient revenue strategy, it will require that everybody pays their share. So oh, we have a very interesting question here, which is, in both Pittsburgh and Miami, NFL teams are allowed to have fans in stadiums, which could be considered a large public health risk. Um, how do you balance these high revenue and extremely popular industries with protecting residents? 
Mes Juarez or Mayor Peduto, would either, either of you like to comment on that? Sure. So in, in the case of Miami and the Dolphins, uh, two things. One is the governor did allow uh, a stadium to be at capacity. And the Dolphins, to their credit, have done two things. The first is they spent millions of dollars uh, making the stadium as touchless as possible and trying to make the stadium as COVID compliant as possible. They probably set the standard in the NFL, uh, though uh, the Seattle Seahawks and the Pittsburgh Pirates may, I mean, the Pittsburgh uh, Steelers may 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 think otherwise. Uh, but the second thing is they, they actually decided not to take advantage of the ability that the governor gave them to go to a full stadium. So in, in Miami, at least in the short term, at least for this weekend, they're going to be at 13,000. Uh, as opposed to the 65,000 that they could be at a full stadium. So they have actually decided themselves uh, that despite the obvious revenue increase that they would generate from being at 65,000, it's you know more than three times, uh, four times what, what they're, what they're uh, currently doing. They're going to stay at that 13,000 uh, because what we've seen throughout sports is, you know, you could be at 65,000 for one week, but if you have a super spreading event, and you have, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100,000 people that get sick. I mean, that's going to destroy your brand. You're going to have to shut the season down. Uh, so I think they've taken the prudent route. Uh, I don't know how long they'll stay at the 13,000, but I can tell you that I'm very proud of the fact that they have remained disciplined and decided to wait a little longer and see how things work out. Yeah, I, I would right. just add in, in Pennsylvania, the governor has allowed 5,500 uh, fans uh, within Heinz Field for both Pitt Panther football and the uh, Steelers football. Um, we've only had one game so far. Uh, it seems that the Steelers were able to do the job that was required. We are watching uh, places like Miami and other cities that have been doing this uh, for a few weeks longer and just trying to learn any lessons possible. I will say this though, and it's something that people need to be cognizant of. We're just entering into the COVID season and the COVID, uh, the, the virus itself has a time of year that it, it is producing. And that is from late October through late February. And we're going to see a spike uh, around this country in the next couple of weeks. And the question is whether that spike will exceed what we saw back in March and April. Uh, there's, a, there's a chance that it will. So any of these rules that are being put into place regarding uh, crowds or, or any type of a place where people gather could very well change dramatically over the course of the next couple of months. So Jillian, I think right. I'm maybe the I think I'm Mesa, the minority jump in or should I go to the next question? Yeah, no, I'd like to jump in a little bit. What, Look, you I don't, know I'm you the don't. minority. I know. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I think I'm a minority among my mayors here. We do not have people going into our stadiums live. And that's because the science we think is clear that gatherings are what spread this virus. And we are still in the middle of a very contagious, very deadly pandemic. Um, it has been hard because our Seahawks and our fans love each other, but they've done what's right. They've protected the team. They've protected the fans. We're five and zero, oh, so it's working. Um, and I just think that, you know, we can't, you know, we need to have as much normality as possible, but we've got to respect the actual science. And the science says if you bring people together in close proximity for long periods of times, you're going to spread the virus. And so I know it is, it's an economic hardship on sports teams. It's hard on the colleges. But we've seen what happened, for example, in Boston, where the key quarterback got COVID. Um, and that has decimated their team's ability to compete. We've seen the NFL scrambling to redo games. And so I, I really believe that we've got to, you know, while we need a return to normality and here in Seattle, we're doing all we can, for example, to help restaurants by providing outdoor space, because we know the disease spreads less in the outdoors and well-ventilated places as long as you take the other precautions. But I do think that um, as a country, you know, it doesn't it doesn't do any of us any good to pretend the science is isn't what it is, which is 
it's a contagious disease. It's killed hundreds of thousands of Americans. Millions have gotten sick. We're about to see this, the period of time where we can have an uptick. Now's the time to be more careful, not less careful. Right, right. Well, we have an interesting question here, which is, these past few months have been a moment of national reckoning and a time of dual pandemic, referring to both the coronavirus and racism. Um, how has that affected urban governance? And we also have a question about how this has affected your concept of tackling equity issues and dealing with the most vulnerable. I'm curious, you know, as you sit here now, you know, what do you think you've learned about what it means to have been a mayor? And would you have taken on this job a year ago if you'd known what it was going to be um, turning into? Maybe I can start that with um, you, Bill, um, Mayor Perduto, because I think you've got the biggest grin. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting time to be a mayor. And I think uh, my colleagues would agree. Um, we're getting it from both the right and the left. Um, no matter what it is that the decisions are being made, people are so polarized right now, but they are also very um, uh, set in their ideas that what we have to do is do the job of being pragmatic in getting the job done. And I think in some ways what the public wants is a cheerleader for either, uh, either side. Um, somebody once said to me, and I, I, I believe this, there's three parties, political parties in America. There's Democrats, Republicans, and mayors. Uh, we don't get the opportunity to be philosophical uh, or to try and just spread a, a theory. We have to pick up the garbage on Monday morning. And so when we're seeing in this crisis of both a global pandemic and a national uh, emergency centered on racism. Um, what we are dealing with are all of the side effects of both, of uh, making sure that we're keeping our public safe and that we're doing everything we can to lessen the impact of a pandemic in trying to build more equitable policies, programs, and projects throughout our cities in order to lessen the real issues of racism. Um, I think what makes the job difficult is when both of those issues become politicized and when you're not dealing directly with those that are the most affected by both a pandemic or by uh, systemic racism, but you have spokespeople uh, who uh, have their own agenda, who try to push that agenda into that narrative. And being able to take on all of that um, is the job of a mayor. And I, I, I can't speak for my colleagues, but I would say unequivocally, if I would have known all of this would have happened last year, hell yeah, I would have said I want to be a mayor. And that's what you sign up for. Well, you're going to have, I hope you're all keeping great memoirs, by the way, because or you know, diaries, because I think that, you know, some of these diaries at the front line of the decision making, um, you know, would be absolutely fascinating. And unfortunately, what tends to happen after a national crisis is that it's a federal government that gets, you know, the diary keeping, the memoir keeping spotlight. I think what you guys are doing at the front line is, pro front lines is probably absolutely as fascinating, if not more fascinating and more real. But Mayor Suarez, what about you? What have you feel like you've learned in the last um, last year about governance? Because you know you have had such an interesting position. Quite apart from the fact you had COVID first, um, you know you have been in the spotlight because of the very febrile politics that are swirling around Florida, um, and you know it's going to play into the next election as well. So I'm kind of curious, you know, what what you think you have learned or what you hope to learn for the future. Well, I think the first thing is it's it's good to know that the next uh, three weeks are going to be very boring, right? There's not going to be anything interesting happening over the next three weeks. No, listen, I, I can't agree more with Mayor Peduto. And in fact, I'm going to use his line because I think that's a great line of the three political parties in America, Republicans, Democrats, and mayors. Uh, I always to say that, the, that if I had to create a, a, a political party, it would be called the Solutions Party. And I think, uh, you know, I think what I think that that quote from Mayor Peduto really exemplifies that the mayors are about solving problems. And I think that brand has been elevated throughout these crises because we've been required and forced 
to solve these problems. A lot of the decision-making has been pushed down from the federal level to the state level down to mayors. And so a lot of mayors have had to make these tough decisions. We've had to create our own set of experts, uh, epidemiologists, biostatisticians. Uh, it wasn't until recently that I started getting calls from the coronavirus task force on a weekly basis. And now I'm having direct conversations myself with Dr. Burks, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Redfield, uh, and, and Dr. Adams, the Surgeon General. So, you know, when there's a leadership vacuum, mayors have been the ones that have been stepping into that vacuum. And that has given us a national and international profile, uh, which I think has been refreshing. And I don't think it's an accident that in the last uh, presidential election on the Democratic side, there were multiple candidates that were former mayors. Uh, Pete Buttigieg, uh, Cory Booker, uh, 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 Julian Castro, uh, mayor, uh, you know, major candidates that uh, went very far in the nominating process that were former mayors. Uh, I think that's here to stay, frankly. I do think you're going to see uh, more mayors, uh, particularly in, in the world that we live in today, where it's, you know, the, where there's a ubiquity to the ability to be able to communicate uh, on, on, uh, on, on, you know, on, on laptops and on computers and on on, on obviously on uh, Zoom and and on Skype, you're going to see mayors more at the forefront. And I think people really like to see the no nonsense, uh, nonpartisan, uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, uh, these mayors, the ones that are on the call and many others have become my personal friends. We are we lean on each other. Uh, we talk to each other constantly about best practices. And oftentimes we have no idea what political party we come from or you know, there have been people that have known me for months and said, I just realized that you were a Republican. Um, and so, you know, I think the reason why is because we uh, we we speak direct. Uh, we speak to the issues. We don't get caught up in a lot of the partisan politics and we don't really have that luxury, frankly. How often? I'm very curious, actually. Um, I, I'd love to ask a question to uh, Mayor Durkin as well. Um, because I often think that you guys are acting a bit like you've got a sort of self-help group, uh, if you like. Um, and, you know, you probably all need to sort of band together at times like this, you know, and both swap ideas, but also overcome the Hunger Games. You know, if you can turn Hunger Games into Kumbaya, I think you're doing something that most Americans will applaud you for. But, Mayor Durkin, I'd like to ask you what your thoughts are on this. So I agree with my two mayors. I think that mayors across America really have been at the front lines. And we've created the playbook on COVID. And we take advantage of what we've learned from each other and trying to figure out how do we balance all these interests? How do we, like Mayor Peduto says, pick up the garbage on Monday, but then also address what we're seeing in the streets across America, the uprising on civil rights and a racial reckoning, to know that when we come back from COVID, we can't just come back the same. We have to come back better and more equitable. And we're having to address this real inequities that we saw. You know, when I came in as mayor of Seattle, we I could see the deep inequities that were being built into the systems because the innovation and technology economy was building prosperity for some, but others were getting left behind. And COVID has only accelerated that. And it's been our communities of color that have suffered most under the health impacts of COVID the disparities are really quite shocking here in Washington state, even with our low numbers, our African-American and Latinx communities are disproportionately hit. Same is true with the economic hits, it's hitting our communities of color. So while we're looking at these issues of race in America around policing and other institutions, one of the things I did in my budget was, we know we have to deeply invest in those communities of color to, to make up for the under-resourcing and the systemic racism of the past. So even with a, almost a $300 million shortfall, I created a $100 million fund for investment in our black, indigenous, and communities of color communities, um, driven by a community process. So they could identify community-based solutions and where those investments need to be made to really build true resiliency and true community safety. And I think you're seeing those kinds of actions by mayors across the country. If, if and when we get through COVID, every good thing coming out of this, literally, I think, is because of mayors. Um, they have been <laughs> the closest to the people. They're the ones getting the solutions and driving solutions. We're talking and learning from mistakes and building on successes. So I'm really thankful to have the mayors I have as my friends across the country. 
Well, all I can say is it's a pity that the mayors aren't on the ticket um, for next month. And we are obviously preaching to the converted, but I do think that many Americans would feel that Washington was doing a much better job today if it was acting like a gigantic madam. But anyway, sadly, you all have to go off and do your real jobs now, although I do hope you're keeping a good diary. Um, I'd like to say thank you to you from the bottom of my heart, both for exposing the somewhat terrifying challenges that are coming down the tracks. And I think what you say about the risk of depression, the fiscal challenges, the nightmarish challenge getting out the vaccination, the issues of equity is very, very sobering indeed. And yet I think I speak for everyone watching to say what is perhaps most encouraging is that not only are you committed to trying to find practical solutions, you're committed to talking to each other, whatever party you come from, and essentially being civil, decent, and doing everything you can to build that all-important ingredient for recovery, which is trust. So thank you. Good luck. Get back to your day jobs. And I think we all wish you the very best of luck and stay safe. Thank, thank, you. thank you too. You.